there's two kinds of, of items that people buy and think they're investing. One really is investing and the other isn't. If you buy something, a farm, an apartment house, or an interest in a business, and look to the asset itself to determine whether you've done something, what the farm produces, what, what the business earns, and so on, uh, you don't really care whether the stock market's open. You can do that on a private basis. In fact, you do it on a private basis if you buy a farm or apartment house generally. And it's a perfectly satisfactory investment. You look at the investment itself to deliver the return to you. Now, if you buy something uh, like uh, Bitcoin or, or some, some cryptocurrency, you don't really, you don't have anything that's producing anything. You're just hoping the next guy pays more. You've praised uh, the president's tax cut, calling it a wind at uh, Amer the American economy's back, I guess. More no, I have, said, I, I have said that it, it is a wind, a tax bill that was targeted to, in a big way to help corporations. So it helps Berkshire's million shareholders. It isn't what I would have done if I was going to have a tax cut. But so as an individual, I do not agree with the philosophy that led to it. But as a steward at Berkshire Hathaway, I have to tell you that it does our shareholders a lot of good. I see. I was Because I was going to ask you, I mean, there must be a cost to this. Is there? There's always a cost. Right. I mean, <laughs> and, and it sort of suggests that the savings from the government then, all that money was maybe misspent by the government. I mean, what is there a cost, a downside to the tax cut? Well, there's always, I mean, let's just say, that if, you, if you take taxes to zero for everybody yeah. in the country, I, I, you would be issuing a lot of bonds. Uh, uh, the, uh, but there's, you can't ever do just one thing in economics. If, I mean, you probably can't in physics either. There's a butterfly effect. But in economics, you always have to say, and then what? And uh, if you give a large break to one group, it's not free. <laughs> if I were going to cut the revenues of the United States, I would have, I would have helped a different group of people. Uh, uh, but as I say, it, it is very helpful to Berkshire. Uh, it's not that we were non-competitive before, but our shareholders are better off. Don Harding, one of our uh, readers, uh, viewers, uh, asked, so have you increased salaries and benefits uh, for Berkshire employees like some other companies have done in the wake of the announcement about Yeah, taxes. some of our portfolio companies have done that. But, but we're not paying dividends. We're not repurchasing shares. We're investing, and we'll, we'll use the money for investment. Uh, I wonder, Warren, what you think of President Trump's tweets, particularly about the stock market. And one of our readers asks, uh, Yuan Yi Chin from San Mateo, how Warren Buffett would rate President Trump. Well, well I'm not going to rate the presidents, but I would say that communication is enormously important for a president. Going back to Roosevelt, in the 1930s, every family in the country was sort of huddled around its radio. I mean, you, you, if, if, if you had the, the big networks, you, could, you were talking to everybody. And now it's much more diffused, and obviously uh, President Trump feels that he does not like it filtered through the traditional news media, so he's, he's going to do it directly. I believe communication is enormously important for a CEO, and I like to talk to our shareholders directly. If I were frustrated with my ability to talk to my, uh, the people I'm responsible for, I would try to figure out a way to do it directly, and obviously I, the president feels that way. So can we talk a little bit about the health care initiative? Have, have you told the story about how that came about? Did Jamie call you up on a conference call with Jeff? How, how did it happen? I think probably, you know, I, I can't answer it uh, with 100% precision, but mm -hmm. I, uh, my impression is that it, it came about because there's a fellow quite young that works for us, uh, Todd Combs, is also on J.P. Morgan's board, and, and Todd and I have talked a lot about health care, and, and I think Todd developed some ideas about how something like this might work, and I think he... He's the one that actually talked to Jamie. And is this really just for these three companies, or is it going to be a model for the rest of the healthcare system? What's the point? I, I hope if we can figure out a way to have better care at lower cost and stem the constant rise as a percentage of GDP, I hope the, every company in the United States <laughs> steals the idea from us. And, and just to also want to touch on cryptocurrencies, I, I know that you've had some uh, negative feelings about them, but now Wall Street institutions seem to be dipping their toes in. And I wonder, A, if you change your mind at all, and B, the biggest, one of the biggest mysteries in America, what did you tell Katy Perry? 
about <laughs> well, cryptocurrencies. That's between me and Katie. I guess so, because it said that you guys talked about cryptocurrencies, but none of us know what you guys said. That's well, just we between did. you two? We did. Okay. But uh, I will answer your question okay. about, about it. But there's two kinds of, of items that people buy and think they're investing. One really is investing and the other isn't. If you buy something, a farm, an apartment house, or an interest in a business, and look to the asset itself to determine whether you've done something, what the farm produces, what, what the business earns, and so on, uh, you don't really care what the stock market's open. You can do that on a private basis. In fact, you do it on a private basis if you buy a farm or apartment house generally. And it's a perfectly satisfactory investment. You look at the investment itself to deliver the return to you. Now, if you buy something uh, like uh, Bitcoin or, or some, some cryptocurrency, you don't really, you don't have anything to produce anything. You're just hoping the next guy pays more. And the next, and you only feel you'll find the next guy to pay more if he thinks he's going to find somebody that, that's going to pay the more. Now, if you ban trading in farms, you could still buy farms and have a perfectly decent investment. If you ban trading in, in apartment houses or even in equities, if you ban trading in Berkshire Hathaway for the next five years, our investors would do fine, you know, over time. And, but... If you ban trading in tulip bulbs, you know, or if you ban trading in, in some Bitcoin, which nobody knows exactly what it is, uh, people would say, well, why in the world would I buy it? Yeah. And you aren't investing when you do that. You're speculating. There's nothing wrong with it. If you want to gamble, somebody else will come along and pay you more money tomorrow. That's one kind of game. That is not investing. Interesting. Um, I want to ask you some questions for the Chinese audience. Um, first of all, can you say ni hao to them? <laughs> ni hao. <laughs> all right. Uh, how much do you think the Chinese economy and markets will ultimately become like the United States? How much convergence do you think there will be? I, I really don't know the answer to mm -hmm. that. I, what I do know is they have found the secret sauce for themselves, just like we found the secret sauce a couple of centuries ago. And so they have had an economy in the last 60 years or thereabouts. They have unleashed the potential of their citizenry. And where for really centuries they did not progress that much economically for overwhelming portion of their population. What they've done in the last 50 or 60 years is a total economic miracle. I never would have thought it could have happened. But the truth is, they're as smart as we are, they work as hard as we are, and, and, and they can have a growth in the economy from a lower base that will exceed ours percentage-wise for a long time. And I mean, they're, they're destined for a, a fine economic future just like we are. Shifting gears, Warren, I want to ask you about women in the workplace and the Me Too movement. What role can men play to advance women in their careers in business and in the economy? Well, you know, I had and have two sisters that are absolutely smart as I am and, and, and better personalities and <laughs> you'd like them better. <laughs> then, you know, they were born around my time of 1930 and, and uh, they were told uh, marry early and marry well. You know, that was the unseen message. I mean, nobody ever said it that way. But uh, uh, So I have seen half of the United States' talent basically put off to the side. And it's one of the things that makes me optimistic about America is when I look at what we accomplished using half our talent for a couple of centuries, and now I think of doubling the talent that, uh, that effectively employed, or at least has the chance to be, uh, uh, it makes me very optimistic about this country. And good managers are scarce. You know, talent is, is, is always rare, and you better use every bit of it that you can <laughs> find it, certainly the way I've felt personally all my life. Skip from Baltimore wants to know if you collect Social Security. I collect it, uh, and my wife is now eligible, and she's supposed to be collecting, but she hasn't gotten her check yet. But, but we'll, uh, we'll see what she should be getting here pretty soon. Tasia from Columbus, Ohio asks, plenty of time left, Warren, but got to ask you, what do you want to be remembered for? As a teacher, yeah. Uh, that would be very flattering if I, I would feel if that was on my tombstone, because I, I, I benefited from terrifically from teachers, not all teachers who were employed as teachers, but teachings of all kinds. But uh, uh, the people spending their time to pass along what they have learned. So a teacher, not a great investor. Yeah, well, uh, 
I don't do anything in investing that, <laughs> that, that that's complicated. I've just been at it a long time. I mean, just look at it. if I just put that hundred and fourteen dollars <laughs> in the S and P, I'd have four hundred thousand now. <laughs> well, I think there's a little more to it than that. Uh, Scott from Papillion, Nebraska says, "How do you tell the difference between reasonable and unreasonable fear?" So, in other words, the stock's down, maybe it should be down, or a stock's down, maybe it shouldn't be down. Well, you just keep looking at the facts. I mean, you're, you're looking at a business. That's the important thing. You, know, you don't look at a stock chart. I looked at stock charts for years. I used to have a lot of fun doing that. I was kind of groping around for all the philosophy. You look at the business. I mean, how do you decide? If you own a half interest with, with you, some buddy of yours in a McDonald's store, how do you decide you know, whether it's a successful investment? Well, if, if the snow's two feet out and there's no business today, do you, do you say, well, I made a terrible deal? No, you look at how it's performing as a business over time, how it's doing versus the competition, you know. All right, Warren Buffett, thank you very much for all of your time. Great talking to you. Okay, thanks for having me. Nos vemos pronto con otros videos. Si le gustó, por favor, no olviden suscribirse, darle un like y darme su opinión más abajo en los comentarios. El macrocapitalista les dice... Chao. Si está pensando en invertir a largo plazo en el mercado de valores, puede descargar la lista de las 8 acciones que no solo pensamos que van a ser las primeras en salir de la crisis, pero también que se podrán mantener en la cartera a largo plazo.